James chapter 1. James chapter 1 verses 2. Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has grown, uh, has a chance to grow. So let it grow. For when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. If you need wisdom, ask our generous God, and he will give it to you. He will not rebuke you for asking. But when you ask him, be sure what, uh, that your faith is in God alone. Do not waver, for a person with divided loyalty is, uh, is uh, as unsettled as a wave uh, of the sea that is blown and tossed by the wind. Such people should not expect to receive anything from God. Their loyalty is divided between God and the world, and they are unstable in everything that they do. Let's jump to verses 12. God blesses those who patiently endure testing and temptation. Afterward, they will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. And remember, when you are being tempted, do not say, God is tempting me. God never tempted to do wrong. And he never tempts anyone else, anyone. Temptation comes from our own desires, which will entice us and drag us away these desires give birth to sinful actions. And when sin is allowed to grow, it gives birth to death. So don't be misled, my dear brothers and sisters. Whatever is good and perfect comes down to us from God our Father, who created all the lights in the heavens. He never changes or casts our, our cast a shifting shadow. He chose to give birth to us by giving us uh, his true word, and we, out of all creation, became his prized possession. Um, I was, um, I don't know, hey, by the way, today we, did you, did you realize we sang all the songs that are like 20 years ago? Every single song is, is like 98, 1998. For those of you who are not born, there's, there's all the songs that we sang were some of the best songs uh, that, that we, you know, that we used to worship. Um, so it, it, it kind of made me very nostalgic this morning as past, um, you know, Brother Selwyn began to lead us and so many beautiful songs that he, you know, Don Moen sang. So I don't know if you know this, we used to have before Google something called Britannica, uh, you know, Encyclopedia Britannica. I don't know if you know that. Uh, and I was, uh, uh, I was a very ardent reader of Encyclopedia Britannica. Uh, in, 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 in Bible college, that's the only thing that I would read all the time. I mean, sometimes more than the Bible itself. I'm ashamed to say that, but I, I, I loved reading stories. I loved reading, getting information into my head. And one of the stories that I read was a very fascinating one. In, um, in 1982, on the 2nd of July, uh, Brian Heiss got up um, you know, early in the morning with, uh, looking forward to an exciting day in Provo, Utah, um, because that day he was uh, going to uh, go for his uh, you know, the military ceremony that was going to be held in university, which, is get, which basically they are getting ready for July 4th, uh, for, you know, for, for the American celebration of July 4th. So when he got up on that day, while expecting he wanted to have a good day, he had a really bad day. I mean, it's, it's just that it's almost as if somebody really wanted him to hurt on that day. So when he got up in the morning, he, came, he realized that his apartment um, was flooded because of a broken pipe um, um, of, because, uh, from the upstairs uh, apartment. Um, so the manager told him to go out and get a you know, water vacuumer uh, so that he can vacuum out the water from his apartment. And as he went out, he realized that his car had a flat tire. So he began to change the flat tire. Once he changed it, he went back inside. He was really so tired, he wanted to call his friend and tell him to get the water vacuumer. So he picked up the phone and began to call. As he dialed his friend's number, because of the leakage of the water, this phone had electricity passed through it. It jerked him so much that he had ripped off the phone. He didn't have a choice. He needed somebody to help him, so he began to... Uh, he thought, okay, let me just go out and take the car and go. And even as he reached to his, uh, his, uh, his door, his door got jammed because of water logging, you know. The door got really 
swollen and it got jammed and he couldn't, he couldn't open it. So he had to shout from his window for the neighbor to come and the neighbor had to kick the door down. So he's, he's basically his front door is gone now, um, you know, to get out. And as he got out in all this, among all this, when he reached uh, uh, to, to pick his car, his car vanished. Somebody stole his car. And so as he began to walk towards a, a, a store where he can buy at least a word of walk, you know, vacuum and come back, uh, he realized two blocks away from his home, his, cars, his car was left there because I guess the robber didn't realize the car didn't have gas inside it. And so, <laughs> so when he saw his car, he didn't have a choice, but he had to push his car all the way to the gas station and reached, filled the gas, uh, came back home, and finally, uh, uh, you know, he could he could set his home and get ready. He didn't have enough time. He just had to get ready as fast as he can. And uh, uh, he was the one who was doing the military salute with the, with his gun, right? Um, and he, uh, when he, by the time he reached in all this, uh, uh, you know, he forgot to um, set his bonnet right on his on his on, on his gun. Um, during the practice is time. Um, somehow the bonnet stayed, managed to stay there. But when he finished the practice and wanted to go back home, tired, and he wanted to get back home, and he threw his gun inside the inside the car before he could come to the driver's side and sit down. It so happened that as as the gun fell, it just the bonnet moved out and sta- sat in his driver's seat. He didn't realize that. He opened the car and just sat right on the bonnet. Severely damaged, he drove himself all the way to the doctor. And after the switches, as he was getting switched, uh, he gets a call uh, from his neighbor um, that uh, um, uh, that the roof from his from his bedroom, because of the leakage, the plaster of Paris came off and fell on his one dog that he loved the most, and the dog died. So he came back home. When he reached his home, and as he walked uh, into his home, sad for all the things that had happened on that day, the floor was still wet, and he slipped. Fell on his back, broke his tailbone. So as he was being taken back to the hospital that night, he said something interesting, and I I liked that. That's what I liked. He said this, I guess God wanted me me to die, but he kept missing. God kept missing me. It's a positive attitude, isn't it? It's a very interesting way to put life in perspective. I think that's what James was trying to teach in chapter 1. Life on the earth is going to be unfair and you're going to face difficulties. You may not have the bad day as, as Brad Heiss had, but you might have something like that happening in your life at this point of time. But it's your perspective that's going to change the outcome of what you're going through. That is the whole point of chapter 1. And he says a mature person knows how to be positive under pressure. A mature person knows how to be positive in the middle of his problems. That's why he begins off. It's almost like as if he is dropping a bomb on us when he began to talk uh, about the problems. He says, consider it pure joy. My brothers and sisters, consider it pure joy whenever you face trials of many kinds. Your attitude um, is what's going to make a difference when you face your problems. And this morning, I want to teach on that. How do we profit out of our problems? How do we stay positive under pressure? Can I do that? Okay? Uh, If you have your notes, if you brought your notes back, okay, start writing down your notes. And this is going to help you. If you you did not, uh, if you don't have these notes, the real mature notes, you, I hope we have, do we have any more left? If you don't, yeah. If you don't have, if you did not pick up last week, Okay, we have the notes for you. You can just pick it up. Uh, As you lift your hand, our host will just get it to you and give it to you. uh, Your attitude, I realized, uh, and I think uh, James was trying to teach us this, that your attitude is determined by your understanding of what's happening in your life. 
So real maturity is being positive under pressure. So I want to, I want to divide this sermon into two parts. I want, um, I want to talk about four facts that you and I need to understand regarding problems and pressure in our lives. And then we will look at how do we handle problems or the pressure in our lives. Can I do that? All right? Okay. Let's look at this. Four facts of life that James states within that, in that, in that chapter. Uh, we are all, everything we are learning today is from James. It's not, uh, I didn't put the notes down. It's just James already said that. I'm just simply arranging it for you to understand in the right way. Four facts of life that you need to know. Number one, problems are inevitable. Problems are inevitable. The scripture doesn't say if you encounter problems, consider it joy. That's not what James said. He didn't say if, he said whenever. Meaning problems are going to come into your life. And for some of us, we may have more problems than others. But problems in life are inevitable. Problems at work are inevitable. Problems in ministry are inevitable. Problems in relationship are inevitable. You're just going to have problems in life. Problems are inevitable. Count on it. They're, they're just going to be there. So don't be surprised when you encounter a problem because the Bible already tells us that whenever in this world you will have tribulation. Bible says that. Jesus said that. In this world you will have tribulation. You're going to have troubles. That's what Jesus said. So if Jesus said, that means you're going to have troubles. Peter goes on to say the same thing. He says, don't be surprised when you have problems. Writing in uh, 1 Peter, he says, don't be surprised when you face problems. Problems are going to be there in your life. As, as true as it is that you're breathing at this point of time, it is sure that you're going to face problems in the face of circumstances, problems in the, face of, in, in the, in the form of sicknesses, problems in the form of people, people sometimes could be people who are from within your family. Okay? So you are going to face problems in life. They are not an elective course for us. They are a required course for us. That's what James is trying to teach us, you know. Hey, they're just a requirement for your life. You don't get out of them by saying you don't want to have any problems. You just have to accept. Nobody is immune uh, to problems. Uh, there was a very famous book, a Christian book written by an author called Scott Peck. If you can pick it up, uh, uh, pick it up and, and read this book. It's called The Road Less Traveled. The Road Less Traveled. In fact, it became such a big seller. Um, even people uh, from across the world, um, uh, leaders and you know, some of the management institutions actually teach on this. Um, the Road Less Traveled. The very first sentence of that book, it's a very small book, it's like more like a self-help book, but it's actually a Christian book. Um, the very first sentence of that book starts off with this, life is difficult. That's the first sentence of that book. Life is, nobody wants that, right? But that is true. Life is difficult. It is inevitable that you're going to have problems in life. So that's number one, fact number one. Fact number two, problems are unpredictable. Not only they are inevitable, but they are unpredictable. So whenever you face problems, the word face in Greek, that word, the, you know, we translated that whenever you face problems, that word face is not, the, not talking about this face, right? You know uh, what he's talking about. It, the Greek word is peripepto. Um, it literally means to fall on you unexpectedly. That's what it means. It literally means to fall on you unexpectedly. You could be walking um, 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 you know, under a secured roof uh, without actually, uh, you know, without any fear, without any uh, um, you know, uh, expectation of trouble. And as you walk, it would just simply fall on your head. Like the guy, Brian Heiss, who had experienced, I mean, unexpected stuff fall on him. Problems come into your life unexpectedly. Um, and uh, they're unpredictable. You can't predict them. You just know they're coming. But you can't predict when they're coming. It's the same, same word. The word peripipto was used when um, mm, the story of Good Samaritan was written, when Jesus said that. And as uh, um, gospel writers began to write the story of 
uh, Good Samaritan, um, and uh, you know, in Greek, that's the same word. Uh, just as how unexpectedly he faced thieves, just as how unpredictably he got beaten up and and was uh, and was thrown uh, to be abandoned um, on on that uh, on on that road. Um, it was the same uh, same unexpectedness that this uh, um, good Samaritan comes and takes the Jew uh, who was beaten up and, you know, so that's, that, that's what it is used, un, unexpected. Trials are unplanned in your life. Sometimes you lose people you love and unexpectedly you lose them. There's nothing you can do to stop it. Sometimes you lose a job and you did not expect it, anticipate it. But that's what life is going to look like. We seldom can expect, uh, anticipate problems that we are going to experience in life. That's probably is good, because otherwise, if we begin to anticipate problems all the time, we would live in fear. We would not take, take risks, we would not have confidence in anybody, and we would not move uh, at all. We would stay at the same place, get stuck in the same place all the time. So there is a benefit of unpredictable nature of problems in our lives. It's, it's good. It actually helps us to keep moving on. Otherwise, our mind is always on that. And because problems are unplanned, unpredictable, that's what makes a problem. Problems are unpredictable. Number, number three, problems are of many kinds. Problems are of many kinds. Isn't that what he said? Whenever you face problems of many, type, many kinds, now, problems come in all shapes and sizes. Now, here is the truth. That what looks like a big problem to me may not be a big problem for you. But what looks like a big problem for you may look like a small problem for me. Okay? So, depending on who we are, what we face, how we understand, how we perceive this world, problems come in different shapes and different sizes. That's one thing about problems is this, we never get bored of them. That much is for sure. You can get bored of me today, but problems don't keep you bored at all. They'll keep you excited. It's like, uh, you know, we used to have something called Baskin Robbins. I know I don't see them anymore. Baskin Robbins was so famous um, because of the variety of the ice creams that it, it used to offer. And we would always talk about the 31 flavors of Baskin Robbins, uh, you know. And we, as you know, when we were going to college, growing up, um, that would be our task. Can we finish all the 31 flavors? I, I actually think problems come like that: 31 different flavors in our lives. Problems are of many kinds. They come in many shades, many varieties. They vary in intensity. They vary um, in variety. They vary during the. the, the um, in, in, in timing and in duration. For some, it could be just a short period. For some, it could be a longer period of uh, trial and, uh, and difficulty. Um, some could be just minor inconvenience, but some could be major crises um, in our lives. We, um, we have all kinds, all shapes of problems. Number four, the fourth fact is this, and this is important for you today. Problems are purposeful. Problems are purposeful. That was the perspective James wanted us to develop first. He's saying definitely you're going to face problems. They're inevitable. And they will come unpredictably. And they will come in all kinds of sizes and shades and uh, you know, variety. But here is something that I want you to know, church. Know my brother and my sister. That every problem that you face, every problem that God allowed in your life is with a purpose. God wouldn't want to see you in trouble. He doesn't like to see you struggling. But he allows struggles in our lives because he has a purpose behind it. Pain can produce uh, something good out of us. I, I realize that pain can be productive. I, was, uh, I don't know if you have ever read this book by an author called Philip Yancey. He talks about fearfully and wonderfully um, made in his image. Two books, actually. He wrote two books. Uh, taking the story of a doctor called Dr. Paul Brandt, who was a missionary in India, uh, down south, and he was working among lepers. And so, 
Philip Yancey was so fascinated by Dr. Paul Brand's work, um, he, he spent time working with him and getting to know how human body functions. And as he began to see uh, how human body functions, um, he said, I was so fascinated by the way that God created us. That's why he wrote the book called Fearfully and Wonderfully Made in his image, two books, right? Two, two different books. Brilliant book. And in that, he talks about the importance of pain. He talks about, I, I'm, I'm sure there are doctors here, um, and you will agree with me, that without pain, we would deteriorate. We wouldn't take care of our body. Unless I know there is some kind of pain, I would not know that there is a problem in my body, right? So problem, uh, pain actually is productive. It brings out the problem. So James says, it's okay if you go through pain because it is actually producing something out of you. There are at least three purposes for our problems. Three purposes that are hidden behind our problems. Number one, problems purify my faith. Problems purify my faith. That's why he says, he uses the word testing. James uses the word testing. Your testing produces something good out of you, he says. Testing, um, as in uh, gold and silver, you know, when you test gold, when you test silver, by throwing it to a burning furnace, by, you know, bringing heat, you're taking out the impurities and testing whether the, the gold or the silver is pure. You would heat up gold and, and silver or uh, to, 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 to a high point of, uh, of heat because you want to take out any kind of impurities out of that and, and so that they can be burnt off and pure gold remains. That's exactly what Job said when uh, he was going through what he was going through as he lost everything that he earned, everything that he banked on, he just lost overnight. And he goes on to say this, um, he has tested me through refining fire and I have come out as pure as gold. Towards the end of jo you know, this Job's story, this is Job's declaration of God's purpose for the pain that he had gone through. I've been tested and I've come out as good. Christians, we are like tea bags, you know. Um, a tea bag is useless unless it is put in hot water. It's only after it goes into the hot water, it brings the flavor out. Sometimes God puts us in hot water. And the intensity of the hot water varies, right? You and I know that. Depending on the taste of guy who is drinking it. But it also brings out beautiful flavor out of our lives. Problems purify my faith. Number two, problems fortify my patience. Problems fortify my patience. The testing of your faith develops perseverance, he says. The testing of your faith develops perseverance. It's actually making me strong. Not only I, uh, it's, 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 it's purifying my faith, it, the problem is making me strong. There is a difference between a family that lost a child and a family that was on the verge of losing a child. A family that lost a child and still hung on to God has stronger faith and they can withstand stronger storms now than this, this family. Isn't it true? Isn't it true? Some of us, so not me at least, uh, but I'm, I'm sure there are some people here in this, in this, in this audience and families that have lost a child, a stillborn child or lost a child in the womb. I, I, you are now much stronger at a much better position to help those who are going through a similar kind of crisis in their lives. Because of your faith that was purified, now you have become stronger in your faith. It produces patience. Next time when you face a much bigger storm, you know that last time when I was facing a problem, God helped me through that and I am standing firm. And now I can stand ahead. Uh, I can stand against anything that I'm going to face. And I know I can come through this. Problems fortify. The word perseverance, the word that he used there, literally means 
the ability to stand under pressure the ability to stand under pressure now how does god teach you patience by making everything going on your way definitely not you can't be patient unless you face face situations that will make you impatient like our traffic jams in hyderabad like this one and a half hour long drive just for 5 kilometers i mean they make you patient now i just put on music or a message and just drive i have to reach the church right we learn to be more patient through traffic jams the grocery lines the waiting periods of life number 3 problems sanctify my character problems sanctify my character now they make me more like jesus they make me more mature isn't that what he says the testing of your faith produces perseverance that you may be mature and complete lacking in nothing that you may be mature and complete lacking in nothing that's god's long range goal remember this god's purpose for your life is maturity not comfort god is much more interested in building your character than making you comfortable uh, so that's god's purpose he wants to build a character inside you by allowing you to go through what you're going through right now so your problem has a purpose he will build your character through the word of god the word that you have in your hand uh, um, um, uh, available now for us in in paper form and digital form in any language that you want god made it pro- uh, pro- provided for us because this word will sanctify us john chapter 17 verse 17 says this sanctify he prays jesus is praying for his people you and me and he's saying to the father father sanctify them through your truth the word is truth your word is truth he says so through the word of god and through of course through the circumstances of life god is going to make us um better in our character romans chapter 8 verses 28 for we know all things work out together for good not all things are good that you face in your life but they can work together for your good that's a promise of god i know what you're facing today is not a good thing but while you go through that god will turn it out for your own good that's a promise of god if we love god and are called according to his purpose that's the secret of romans chapter 28 actually the room, the secret of romans chapter 28 was uh, uh, is verse 29 for whom he foreknew he did predestine them to become conformed to the image of the son of god that's the goal so i'm I, he's saying this hey i'm allowing you to go through your problems i know it's not a good thing but i can turn out turn it out to become a good thing for you in the end you're going to become like jesus you're going to be made into the image of my son So if God wants to make us mature he's going to put us exactly in opposite position opposite situation Um if God wants to teach you love he's going to put you around among ungodly unlovely people If he wants to teach you joy he's going to let you go through times of tragedy and sadness so that you may learn to be joyful in spite of your situation If you want peace God is going to put you in the midst of a chaos to teach you what peace actually means Um ask any mother who gets up in the morning and and has to attend to so many things the dinner burning and telephone ring, ringing and and child cribbing and kids diaper being dirty and and kitchen in chaos and and among all this she has to get ready go to the office and still be able to make it that day i guess all mothers are very peaceful they can teach us how to be patient and peaceful in the midst of chaos efficient paul writing to efficient says this we are god's workmanship 
prepared in advance to do his good work. We are God's workmanship, prepared in advance to do his good work. What an amazing uh, God we have that not only he has good things in store, but he has planned for bad things also in our lives. That when, when you face bad things, he, he's not tempting us, he's not putting us in bad, bad situations, but when we are in bad situations, he's still working it out for our good. So keeping that in your perspective, in your mind, I want to give you three suggestions from James chapter 1 on how do we handle when we face problems. Can I do that? Number one. Remember three words. That's all you need to remember. And I will just run through them in like five minutes. Number one, rejoice. Rejoice. When he says rejoice, consider it pure joy. Don't misunderstand what he's saying. He's not saying fake it. Or he's not asking you to put on a fake smile. A plastic smile and pretend. He's not asking you to do that. God never asks you to deny reality of your life. He doesn't mean for you to become some kind of psychological, psychologically imbalanced human being. That's not what he's asking us to do. When he asks us to rejoice. You don't go around saying, good, I got to suffer and I'm glad I'm suffering in my life. That's not what God is expecting you to do. He's not asking you to rejoice for the problem. He's asking you to rejoice in the problem. There's a difference. We don't thank God for the situation, you know. In First Thessalonians, we all, I think one of the most misunderstood words in the Bible is this. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 18. In everything, give thanks for this. For, for this is the will of God concerning you in Christ Jesus. In everything, give thanks. We always keep hammering that into our heads. Sometimes it can lead to a misunderstanding. That it seems like we have to thank God for everything that is happening. So thank God for the cancer. Thank God for the, you know, for the loved one who died. No, no, no. That's not what God is asking you to do. We don't rejoice for the problem. We don't rejoice. Um, for, we, we don't say thank you God for the situation. We're actually, we are, why would I want to thank God for evil? Why would I thank God for, uh, uh, for the bad situation? What I'm doing is, what Paul is trying to teach in Thessalonians and what James is trying to teach us here in chapter 1 is this, that I thank God in the midst of my situation. Not for the situation, but that he's still with me here in the middle of my situation. What makes the difference? If, if you want to do that, if you want to live like that, what, what makes the difference? Your attitude. Consider it pure joy. The word consider in Greek literally means have a deliberate look. So stop looking at your problem. Start developing, deliberately begin to look at everything in your life, it yourself, through the eyes of God. And know that in the midst of all this, God is working in you. I'll tell you one example and then I'll move on to the next one. And I, I'm never tired of this story, by the way. And I love this guy. His books, whatever he wrote, it came from experience. A guy called Viktor Frankl, a Jewish psychologist who spent in Nazi concentration camp in Germany. He has gone through hell. And some of his books, um, you know, talk about the stories of Holocaust and the kind of pain that Jews had gone through during that time. And this is what he says in one of his books. He says, they stripped me naked. They took everything, my wedding ring, my watch. I stood there naked. And all of a sudden, I realized he lost his, um, he lost his entire family, by the way, before he was taken into the concentration camp. His, his own sister was murdered in front of him after being raped. His entire family was burned down and all that stuff. Then he was taken to the um, um, to, the, to the prison camp and this is what he's saying they, uh, his wife is dead um, he, I stood there naked and all of a sudden I realized at that moment that although they could take everything from me my wife, my family, my possessions what they could not do is this that they could not take away my freedom to choose how I was going to respond to what's happening to me you can take everything from me, 
but you cannot decide how I'm going to react to this. That's what James is asking us to develop. When he says rejoice, he's saying, hey, the life can come at hard at you. I mean, really hard at you. But you can choose to respond differently. That's why I like the story of Brian Heiss. I mean, he could find humor in the middle of what he had gone through, hell, in one single day. And at the end of the day, still say, maybe God wanted me dead, but kept me singing. Number two, rejoice. Number two, request. Request. When I use the word, I'm saying, ask for wisdom to learn and grow. Ask for wisdom to learn and grow. You see, the problem with the positive outlook towards the problem is this. We don't, we don't have. We don't know how to develop that. We don't know how to look at positively at our problems. We, we know how to panic in a situation. We know how to run away from problem. We know how to pray to God and ask God, can you take the problem away? You can do that because we know that. We don't really know how to react positively like Viktor Frankl or like how James is asking us or how Paul is asking us. So James knows that we, we go through that struggle. And so he says, hey, if you need wisdom to develop a positive outlook like that, ask God. Ask God for, request, uh, for, for wisdom. And he will give you wisdom so that you can learn out of your situation and grow as a person. Pray. Of all the times, pray when you got problems. What do you pray about? Verses 5. If any one of you lack wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault and it will be given to him. So the problem that you're facing today could be your own handiwork. Maybe it's you who messed it up. Maybe it's you who took wrong decisions, did not listen to the will of God, did not choose to follow the wisdom of God. You, by your own, your own human logic, or because of the pressure from your friends, or whatever, for whatever reason, or, from, or for probably because you, you are so egoistical that you didn't want to listen to anybody, and you made a choice, you made a wrong turn, now you realize you are in a bad situation because of your own fault. But you hesitate to ask God. What James is saying is, hey, it's okay. It's okay. Ask God for wisdom to correct yourself. And he's saying this. The promise is God is not going to hold you for what you have done. It may be your fault, but God is not going to find the fault inside you. People may say that to you. My bola tha na tumko. People may say that. But God is not going to say that. God is not going to find faults in you. And he's going to help you to come out of your trouble. He's going to help you to develop wisdom and, and grow. So ask God for wisdom. For what wisdom? So that you can learn not to waste an opportunity to grow in the midst of your trouble. Say, God, I, like, I want your wisdom so that I'd like to learn how not, not to waste what I'm going through and I could learn more and grow. See, when you say the word wisdom, it simply means this, that you're saying, God, help me to look at my life from your point of view. That's all you're asking him for. When you are in a situation that you know is really bad, don't ask why. Ask what. That's a better question to ask God. What are you trying to teach me, God? Is there something that I need to learn? The why, he already answered. You know, chapter, chapter 1, verses 2, 3, and 4. He already answered the why, why part of your problem. What do you learn is the thing that you need to do and me, I need to do. So ask God, what do you want me to teach to, through this problem? What do you want me to learn, God? What kind of characteristics do you want me to develop? That's number two. Number three, relax. Relax. If there is one thing that we don't know how to do, that is relaxing. Am I right? That's one thing we don't know. Especially the people in high tech city, they don't know. 
There is no, there is no word called relax in our dictionaries. You could probably be planning for what you're going to do tomorrow, right now, sitting here. All right, right after the service, I'm like, oh, it's already 11. You know, you started thinking already. Started planning for the day, started planning for tomorrow. You just don't know how to relax. And especially if you face a tough situation, you just don't know it, how to do it. And the scripture teaches, uh, James teaches you, hey, trust that God knows the best. That's what relaxing means. That's why I started off this morning by showing you that verse in Psalm 125. Trust, those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion. They are firm, as firm as Mount Zion. And that they will not face a defeat and that they are surrounded by the presence of God. What an amazing picture right, that the psalmist paints just like how the mountains surround the city of Jerusalem, the Lord surrounds those who trust Him. Don't forget that today. Eh? Even if you forgot my message right now, just go back remembering those three verses. Psalm 125, two verses. Psalm 125, verse 1 and 2. One and two. Go memorize it. Those who trust in the Lord. That, that was my point of the message anyway. Trust God because He knows the best. I know that some of you have gone through a really tough time in your lives. And I, I know some of your personal stories. Heartbreaking stories. You could probably be, you probably would be, if there is a hall of fame in heaven for people who endured through struggles, some of you probably would have a plaque like there. You know. I'm not telling it in, in the sense of, you know, just for a joke. If there is a really a hall of fame, I'm definitely sure some of your names would be there in heaven. You, but you maintained a sweet spirit in the middle of all, all the odds that are stacked up, up against you. In, in the middle of incredible pressure, some of you, Castonians, I'm very proud of you um, to be a person who is ministering to you. Um, I could learn a thousand things from some of you. I'm glad that God put me among people like you. You... You, you stood firm. Uh, things that people did to you, things that people said about you, situations that you had to go through because of people, you still stuck and still stood up. You are a role model to the world. And those of us who are panicking right now, we got to learn from people like this. That we got to relax. God's got our back. He's got our back. That's what you need to pray for. Pray for wisdom to understand what you're going through and pray for faith to endure through this. Pray for faith to endure through your trial today um, so that you can relax. We need both of them, wisdom and faith. Now, let me close up with this. God is not the one who brought problems into your life. James says that. God doesn't tempt people. He's not interested in putting you through the flames of fire. He loves you. But he allows a situation like that to happen, which they will brought into your life, using people, using circumstances, using your bosses. Devil is uh, uh, you know, bringing that burning furnace into your life through you into that so that you could be distracted take your eyes away from God but God is still allowing that because he wanted to teach you hey it's okay if you're thrown into the fiery furnace I'm standing beside you there in the middle of that relax I got your back verses 12 let me close up that blessed is the man who perseveres under trial that when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those.